Hello and welcome to the Recovery Matters Podcast from CCAR, the podcast where putting recovery first is always the goal. Here we present interviews, discussions, stories, and speeches to cultivate the understanding and acceptance of the power, hope, and healing of recovery from alcohol and other addictions. Here are your hosts, Phil and Sandy Valentine. Philip, <laughs> I'm really excited about today. I'm excited about our guest. I'm excited that you have um, you have some extracurricular activities planned this afternoon that will allow me to have my first experience by myself going to Costco. Costco. <laughs> That's your idea of fun. I've never been to one, and you know our son-in-law, Stefan, is a huge, super fan of Costco. What's Costco? It's like, it's a wholesale club. Oh. They have lots so how much of, is this going to cost us? I'm guessing 200 <laughs> That's what I'm guessing. Just to join, right? <laughs> no, but by the time I walk out of that store, that's my guess. Uh, um, I consider it a blessing if that's what it costs us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the other reason I'm excited <laughs> is because um, our guest today has been around CCAR World for a very long time, and I haven't had a chance to get to know her personally so i'm looking forward to this yeah our guest is ruth riddick will you say hello ruth to everyone um hi hi everyone um <laughs> sandy what a lovely thing to say and thank you for that um it's uh, you know right back at you it's uh, my real pleasure to be here with you today sandy for exactly that same reason and it's always great to spend time with phil <laughs> well we can agree to disagree on that one, but I don't, know. It, I don't know about this podcast. It's, I'm not it's sure getting about better it. over time. <laughs> so it's, we've we've already had a conversation though about definition and why I thoroughly enjoy um, our time together, Ruth. Is that you are one of the most eloquent speakers in the recovery world? That and your messaging is spot on. And um, I just have learned so much from you over the years. So I appreciate all your work. How long have you been at work and in the field now? Well, I think it really depends on how you define the field. Uh, so to be perfectly honest with you. The field is what you say it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. Um, uh, I do remember vividly uh, when I first encountered the Recovery Coach Academy curriculum when I was sitting in a classroom in, uh, in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And that's in 2015. And I remember we were eh, maybe halfway through day one. And I wasn't entirely sure what to expect. Um, and I've found over the years that wandering into uh, those environments where I decide to show up, um, that uh, it's best to, to bring as few assumptions or expectations as possible and just, you know, sort of uh, evaluate the experience after the fact, mm-hmm. you know, sort of rather than circumscribe it ahead of time. So I didn't um, have any idea uh, walking into class what uh, Recovery Coach Academy was going to be like, and I certainly had not ever heard mea culpa. I had never heard of CCAR mm-hmm. or the Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery, and I didn't really quite understand why it would be that in New York State, you know, so we're all pretty territorial and chauvinistic about New York State, um, that w- we would be studying a product out of uh, out of Connecticut, but about halfway through day one, and it wasn't just my day one either; it was the facilitator's day one. About halfway through day one, um, I realized, oh, I know what this is. This is what back in the day we used to refer to in Ireland as non-directive counseling. Mm. And um, back in Ireland, I was a champion of what we used to call non-directive counseling. And the core tenets of that practice, um, I had a service where, uh, where we offered that, where we offered that, that uh, practice. The core tenets were very, uh, were very familiar within the lexicon of the Recovery Coach Academy, um, talking about being person-centered, 
um, talking about being non-judgmental, talking about vesting, if you like, the, the moral authority um, in the individual herself or mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sort of these are, these are concepts that are familiar in this country from, uh, you know, sort of from some earlier work that was done in, uh, uh, in the clinical world. I'm thinking particularly of the work of Carl Rogers. Back in Ireland, when we were when we were talking about these uh, these concepts, and particularly, you know, sort of invoking the name of Carl Rogers, um, really put me on the radical fringe uh, um, of conversation at the time. And the uh, the idea that um, you know, sort of the idea that individuals truly are the experts in their own lives, mm. um, was a radical concept in the Ireland of the nineties. Um, but it was, but it was the modality that uh, that we practiced in my counselling service, and it was a modality um, I very publicly promoted and uh, protected. So when I, I came across some very compatible ideas, and there it's all laid out on day one of the Recovery Coach Academy, very specifically in the spectrum of attitudes. Mm -hmm. Um, where we talk about different kinds of, if you like, service delivery or different kinds of service relationship. Um, and the, the, that whole concept of a um, overwhelmingly reciprocal relationship um, whereby um, individuals are encouraged to, uh, to believe in themselves and to believe in their own decision-making processes and to believe in their own efficacy, and to believe in their own moral authority. These were all very familiar concepts to me, um, represented in Recovery Coach Academy through the prism or the lens, or um, in William White's favorite word, under the rubric mm -hmm. um, of, uh, of recovery. And I felt uh, immediately, immediately at home in the Recovery Coach Academy. Um, and uh, I showed up for that training because um, I wanted to be a trainer in the um, in in recovery coaching, and found that yes, that you know, sort of um, yes, I'd found what I was looking for in your curriculum. So if 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 that's the answer to your question about when did I join the field, that um, uh, that moment or that Damascene moment was in 2015. Sandy, you, you, Sandy, you talk about, oh, Sandy, you talk about, uh, I, I see a similarity when you first took the Recovery Coach Academy. Um, you went in with a certain mindset and came out with a different one. Well, my career, I spent over 25 years um, delivering and leading training and learning solutions and performance consulting and at the time that Phil was asking me to attend, I had a team of facilitators and designers and technical writers. So my ego was busting that I knew excellent instructional design. And if mm -hmm. I went to Phil's favorite, most um, cherished program and had criticism of it, that we could have a problem. But after, it's a long story how I got there, but I finally attended in 2018, in February of 2018. And I asked him what the rules of engagement were. Like, if I had feedback, <laughs> do I share it? Do I keep it? Because I knew he'd ask me what I thought. And, you know, especially with him, my ability to manufacture a mask is not good. Um, and... I got to the end of the week and I didn't have a single recommendation. I wouldn't have changed a thing except maybe the PowerPoint background, but like, <laughs> there was nothing with the way the program over the course of the week, the process that it took you through, there was nothing. And what has been so surprising because I started my master's in social work this fall and I'm taking, oops, I'm taking three classes and it is the Recovery Coach Academy. The model is social work. It is absolutely everything that is being taught academically. 
um, about the life model practice of social work. And so I can see it all come to life and I can see Art Woodard's hand in that because he was a, a master's in social work as well. So mm -hmm. it's been kind of cool to see all the concepts validated by, you know, all the yes. academic gurus, but it's translated in the Recovery Coach Academy that it doesn't matter if you have you know, a high school diploma or a PhD, it translates because it has us connecting and learning from one another. Absolutely. And, res and in the language of the RCA, respecting each other as resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you talked a little bit about Ireland. I mean, judging by your accent, you're probably not born in America. Well, I ask this question of a lot of people. What is your earliest childhood memory? The very earliest, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, uh, although I will say I was, uh, I have a memory of being discombobulated by the arrival of my brother, uh -huh. who is, uh, who is uh, 20 months or thereabouts, uh, my, uh, my junior. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, certainly that was a, a tectonic shift in the emotional life of the family. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm told, although I don't remember, that I was discovered um, one afternoon holding a pillow over him in his cot. <laughs> so clearly the, um, the, the change in the emotional life of the family was so severe uh, as far as I was concerned that I felt the need to take remedial action of a, the most oh, wow. serious kind. But I, my brother has grown up to forgive me and to, uh, <laughs> and to, uh, and to have a, a, a successful family life of his own. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that probably the most potent um, memory from my early childhood is uh, is that of having a sense of adventure. Mm. Um, you know, sort of that whatever whatever the, the the confines of the four walls or the uh, the garden wall or the, um, the the village where we lived, which pretty solidly suburb suburban village, but. Um, that it was never enough that I wanted to see what the next parish looked like. I wanted to see what the next place looked like. And from a very early age, I wanted to travel. Mm. Um, uh, my uncle and my mother's brother would come back from these exotic places like Switzerland with, um, you know, with slideshows. And, uh, you know, sort of I couldn't couldn't wait. Well, I grew out of Switzerland. I did end up visiting Switzerland and it was not to my particularly to my liking. It was way too perfect and too manicured for me. Um, but um, but that that hmm. that interest in travel, that interest in adventure was always with me. And it's ultimately what um, what brought me to this country was that sense of adventure. Um, and I haven't. And, and COVID has not helped, but I haven't had nearly enough adventure around the United States. There's whole areas of your great and vast and wonderful country that remain terra incognita for me. So, you know, so, um, I'll be getting up on my bike once we get through, once we truly get through this pandemic. Um, so there might be, there, I've heard a rumor that drinking is a part of Irish culture. Is, is that true? <laughs> Who told you that? What a slander, Phil. <laughs> um, I think I think that might be a safe thing to say. Okay, so talk about the role of that in your life and in your your childhood and growing up. Well, first of all, um, you know, sort of, I'm a Dublin girl, mm -hmm. uh, which means a couple of things. Well, it means that I'm a city girl first and foremost. So, of course, I now live in New York City. Um, but Dublin, in many in many respects, certainly before the tech boom uh, in the late '90s and early years of this century, um, Dublin was a company town, and the company was Arthur Guinness. Oh. Guinness's Brewery um, employed a huge percentage of Dubliners. Um, and if you got a job at Guinness's straight out of school, 
It didn't matter what kind of a job you got. If you got a job at Guinness's, you were set for life. And the, uh, the, Guinness, uh, the Guinness Brewery and the Guinness business dates back to the 18th century. The family was huge in, uh, in just about every aspect of Irish life. There's still a Guinness family uh, to the good in Ireland. Um, but, the, um, but being a company town, uh, Dublin over the years had benefit, uh, benefited a very great deal from the, the philanthropic um, uh, investment of the Guinness family. So, um, you know, so for, so for example, in this country, you have the Carnegie libraries. In, uh, in Dublin, you had uh, public facilities such as the Ivy Baths, public bathhouses. Mm -hmm. And um, Ivy um, is, was one of the titles of the Guinness family. They were, the, uh, they were, uh, um, uh, it was one of the, the, the aristocrat their aristocratic titles. So Guinness, you're, you're a Dubliner and Guinness is the main company. And I do say I loved Guinness Stout near really? the end. That was one of my most favorite. Oh, well, that's new knowledge. That dark, rich lager. There was nothing like it. It was just incredible. Am I drooling? I don't know. But, you know, every <laughs> I found that for anybody that we interviewed that knew anything about cannabis, he would just go down a trail. And I can see that same trail now that you're talking about Guinness. Yeah, maybe I need a meeting. Who knows? I'm back. All right, so talk to you're talking to us about Guinness in Dublin, and yeah. yeah, I mean, as I say, pretty much prior to the tech boom in the late uh, in the late nineties, you know, sort of when uh, economic policy was to invite in, you know, sort of the big tech companies, and that very much changed the the the, the nature of the landscape. But you know, sort of, but but Guinness's Guinness's brewery and, and the Guinness family infused every aspect of Dublin life. The Irish Parliament meets in a townhouse originally owned and built by the Guinness family. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, sort of, so, so Guinness also assumed, assumed a sort of a role as an unofficial town mascot. <clears throat> so the, you know, sort of, so in conversation around the country, um, you know, so Dubliners would be kind of unofficial ambassadors for Guinnesses because Guinness and our and our city were infused, and that that's a particular cultural conflict um, with uh, our second city, which is you know sort of Cork City in the south, and Cork has its own native brewery, Murphy's Stout. So it became a point of pride over the years that Dubliners would defend. Uh, Guinness as a product against Murphy's as a product, um, you know, sort mm -hmm. of when we were visiting Cork or vice versa when, you know, sort of Corkonians uh, took the liberty of invading our town. So, um, you know, sort of, so I don't know that, that there, I could possibly draw an equivalent in, uh, in American cultural life to how significant uh, Guinness was in the Ireland into which I was born. And uh, it was something of a rite of passage into adulthood, um, you know, sort of to have your first pint of Guinness, to, um, you know, sort of to be taught how to drink Guinness, to acquire a taste for Guinness. It certainly wasn't automatic to me. Um, it was one of those things that, you know, sort of took practice, practice, practice. So we practiced. Um, and um, and of course, it also became something of a feminist flashpoint um, in the 70s and the 80s, because um, traditionally in Ireland, um, uh, public houses were, were uh, segregated along gender lines. And um, uh, not only uh, were, were women expected to conceal themselves in a portion of the uh, of the, the pub layout called a snug, um, uh, but uh, but we were not permitted to be served at larger measures of beer. Hmm. So so the the pint of plain, which is such a cultural touchstone in Ireland, the pint of plain was denied to women by custom. 
um, that you could only uh, order and consume a half pint. So of course, you know, sort of where you know, sort of when we were, you know, young and energetic and full of beans about these kind of, you know, not not so micro uh, aggressions, um, it became a point of principle to demand the the full size pint rather than the ladylike half pint. So um, I hope that by you know, but with these tortuous explanations. I hope I'm giving you some sense of how how multi-layered mm. the Irish engagement is with alcohol. It's not simply, you know, sort of alcohol is a mood-altering drug, and I want to move move to uh, change my mood. That there's very, it's a very much greater uh, artifact or um, a, a cultural object um, than that. Wow. Were you able to get full points? Put it this way, Phil, um, when I ask for something, I can be persistent. <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> so uh, that would be a yes. So Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> and, and what age is that rite of passage? Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that, Sandy, because I, you know, sort of, I certainly can't remember. Um, but, um, you know, sort of by, by 18 years of age, we were, you know, sort of, we were all, you know, sort of fully alive in Irish pop life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I tended to trail on the, uh, on the apron strings of my elders. I was, you know, working professionally in the theatre throughout my teens. And, um, and of course, the, uh, the custom was to repair to the bar after, uh, after shows. So I would just, you know, sort of, I would just trundle along with the group and I'd be there and fully, what? fully part of it. And, hold, you know, hold, I know, hold, I know hold, hold up. Yeah. Hold up. She just dropped that. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about oh, working, you, professionally. Working, working professionally in the theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us about it. How'd that start? Well, I, I remember reading somewhere, uh, Kevin Spacey <laughs> uh, saying about how, um, Nobody ever wanted to be an actor because he had a happy childhood. Oh. And um, I, I, I have to say, I, I re that resonated with me when I, I read it re relatively recently. Um, I, in a sense, I ran away to the theatre at a, at a young age. When I discovered the existence of the theatre, and my parents brought us to the theatre, my parents brought us to the movies. My parents brought us to um, art museums, and, and we had a uh, we had a rich cultural childhood. Um, but I remember when I when I arrived at the theatre as an experience, um, I had a sense of being in a holy place, and. Um, uh, and I've never lost that sense. And it was only obviously later that I discovered, you know, sort of the the, the, the formal history of the theatre and, uh, you know, sort of how, and visited some of the ancient theatres in Greece, for example, um, you know, where uh, religious rites were, were performed, um, as well as, you know, sort of what we would identify as uh, uh, dramatic uh, performances uh, or plays, early or prototype plays. Um, and I was as moved in the um, in the ancient amphitheaters of uh, Greece as I ever was in a uh, in a proscenium arch uh, theater. Hmm. Uh, it, it's you know sort of in a sense the theater is and always has been from minute one my spiritual home, and um, I've, uh, I find every aspect um, of of theater work and life uh, to be. Uh, to be, in a sense, sacred, and um, the uh, there's there's no there's no greater privilege for me than that of um, presenting a play for uh, engagement with you, the audience, whatever my role in that presentation may be, and um, and it's an it's. It's an energetic connection, whether I've simply supplied the props on the stage or I'm actually performing in a role. 
there's an energetic, a live energetic connection with the audience that is extraordinary. And again, the Greeks talk about the cathartic experience of theatre. And, um, you know, sort of, and, uh, and that's, that's extraordinary to be, uh, to be part of and a genuine privilege to be a part of. And, um, you know, sort of, and I remember from the very first time I danced, I came into the theatre via ballet. I remember the very first time I danced in front of a live audience, feeling that connection, that energetic connection, and realizing that um, that 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 connection was vested in my performance, and that I had a again I use the word sacred. I had a sacred responsibility. To, um, to use my ability in performance to elicit that energetic response from the audience, which then translates at its best into their personal cathartic experience. So there's a sense in which live performance um, has that facilitative role of bringing a story with it or a story that is no story, or simply bringing an experience into, into the lived moment, hmm. um, which, you know, sort of no other um, uh, medium does quite so effectively as that. And um, that's, what, that's my background. That's where I come from. I love the smell of the grease paint. I love the roar of the crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not where my career took me. But it's where I started, and it's absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, the most formative experience of my life. How old were you when you had your first experience with the theatre? Uh, I was a, a preteen. You, you um, must have been a pretty good dancer. Or it must uh, still be. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, never, I never proceeded so far that I got to do point work. Mm-hmm. Or have my or have my feet bleed, put mm-hmm. it that way. Okay. Um, continue with your story. Yeah, I'm I'm riveted. I'm just fascinated by how you weave culture and theater. And I think about the experience when I have the rare opportunities to speak before large crowds. But it's I related to what you were saying. It wasn't like necessary, but sometimes I think when I speak, it's almost a performance. But I draw from the energy of the crowd, and they're invested in me doing well. So I love what you said about like a sacred responsibility to that energy to channel it and do the absolute best you can with it. And in turn, they receive something from it. So it is almost, it is an exchange. I never... Mm -hmm. I'd never thought of theater or just kind of like, my mind's a little like. <laughs> Gave Phil something to think about. <laughs> right. As other usual. than fishing. So as it's usual. Really awesome and dad jokes. So we're doing well this morning. Well, maybe I'll be on stage doing a whole series of dad jokes someday. Oh, goodness. So <laughs> where, where did your path detour from the theater? What was the next stop on your journey? Um, there came a point, I mean, I went to theater school and everything. Um, there came a point where I understood that, that your job is in service of the author's text. So if you're, um, you know, if you're playing Tennessee Williams, you're in service of Tennessee Williams or the text uh, that that he uh, uh, that he wrote. Now there are always, you know, sort of minor changes in delivery. Of course there are, and you know, sort of because of that live aspect and that energetic connection, you know, sort of you are in performance. You are always very slightly course correcting, and just as uh, when you're working as a facilitator um, in a classroom. Um, you know, sort of you're responding in the moment 
to the energetic feedback and you're adjusting accordingly. Well, you're doing that on stage too. Mm. Um, but ultimately you are in service of the text. And uh, the, uh, the author's vision as brought to the stage by the director. And there came a point in my life where I understood that um, that, that was too many too many piece, too many pieces of remove that um, that I did not see myself ultimately as um, as having a life in service of other people's texts mm-hmm. that I um, that I wanted to be more hands on with developing and shaping the content. And uh, there are a number of ways of doing that. Um, You know, well, why don't you go and write a play, Ruth? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Or why don't you go and write a, you know, a one woman show? And then you can, you know, sort of you can do the whole lot of it. Um, Well, I am a writer, uh, but I don't write fiction Mm -hmm. and I don't write plays. Mm And uh, that's not to to uh, to circumscribe what I might get up to next year or in ten years' time or whatever. Who knows what I'll get up to? Uh-huh. But um, but at the time in my um, I suppose in my twenty by the time I hit my twenties, um, it became clear to me that I was going to need for myself to have more control over the co- over content. And text, and uh, that's in a sense uh, what led me into uh, the whole world of uh, training, um, because um, training facilitation, especially, um, but training uh, demands a high level of performance, a high level of presence in the moment, a high level of energetic connection. And that's been the, if I might digress in my Irish way for a moment, that's been a core challenge of the COVID era, pivoting to digital. Mm-hmm. Because digital, digital is television. Mm-hmm. The classroom is theatre. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a it's completely different energetic me- medium. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the, um, you know, sort of in that, uh, in that connection, in that presence, in that necessary presence in the moment, that you must have as a facilitator um, and uh, certainly as a trainer. I mean, the whole, the whole purpose of education, the very meaning of the word, the Latin educere, to lead out, uh, demands that I be present to you um, in the, uh, the exchange, in the process, the dialectic process, if you like, um, in which, you know, sort of that, uh, that which is in you, um, is uh, is brought forth and manifest, and um, you know, sort of these are uh, these are this is an experience. Doing this is an experience that, for me, is more urgent than being the um, uh, than being an avatar for an author uh, mm-hmm. who is not me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so I think that's how how I came to an understanding that what I really wanted to be um, was, and I call myself an educator, mm-hmm. and, um, and that's what I've been doing for uh, many decades. There must be a whole storyline of your roles as an educator to what we talked about at the beginning, this interest in recovery. So... How would you tell us that story? We we opened informally, Phil. We opened our chat together this morning by mm-hmm. talking about integration. Mm-hmm. Integration is one of the uh, the stages of recovery um, that you and Kathleen O'Connell identified in the stages of recovery model, which is absolutely one of my most favorite mm-hmm. ever pieces of the uh, the Recovering Coach Academy. 
um, and we can talk a little about, it, about that later on. But the, the core concept of integration, that, uh, that my life as a, uh, as a person in recovery or my life as a healthy person or my life as a whole person um, is one of integration rather than separation. Mm-hmm. So it became um, a question for me early in my personal recovery from uh, alcoholism. I'm a, an old-fashioned commoner gardener, drunk. Mm-hmm. Um, in my early years um, uh, in recovery from alcoholism, I, um, I, I was thinking about that integration piece. Um, it bothered me that, uh, that I was being encouraged to view my recovery as somehow somewhat separate from my life. That makes sense. Um, for people who are outside the tent, uh, that separation took the form of, you know, almost like a sort of a, a hobby. Mm. You know, sort of, oh, Ruth is working on her recovery. You know, she's working on her <laughs> quilt making and she's working on her recovery. You know, it's like some kind of a, some kind of a hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, on the one hand, and how inside the tent, the conversation was exclusively about your recovery. And that bothered me. Hmm. Um, that bothered me, bothered me in both cases, because it seemed to me that where we wanted to go or where I wanted to go was to a place of integrity so that my recovery becomes a, an ordinary part of my life. My life becomes an ordinary part of uh, my recovery, mm-hmm. where there's no, um, you know, sort of, the, so there's no boundary distinction between the two. So if my recovery is to become integrated into my life in that sense, and that was my ambition for myself in the, uh, in the uh, early years of this century, um, then it also uh, stood to reason that uh, that my recovery was going to have to become integrated in some way into my professional practice as a coach yeah. and my professional practice as a trainer. Um, I have been training the uh, you know principles and procedures, the practice of um, what what's called coaching in this country. I've been training that for decades. So it became clear to me that uh, to be a to be integrated in that sense, my recovery was going to have to become part of my training practice, and my training and coaching practice was going to have to extend its arms uh, and wrap around my recovery so that the, the two become integrated. And um, and that's how I came to. Uh, I came to uh, the practice and how I ultimately found you folks. Back in uh, 2004, um, I started advertising um, um, training opportunities around what I was thinking of at that point as um, uh, as a peer modalities. Um, that if I'm a person in recovery and you're a person in recovery or you're a person who's interested in recovery, that, um, that we have that peer connection. And uh, that was the word that I used back in the, uh, in the early years. I had no understanding that that would subsequently become a generic in the field. Um, and that would uh, become a generic that uh, would, in, let's be real, attract a very great deal of stigma. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, sort of back around 2004, 2005, I had never heard of any of you lovely people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, sort of Valentine's um, was, you know, sort of a date in February. <laughs> and, um, uh, and um, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of I had never heard of CCAR or recovery community organizations. I most certainly had not heard of uh, SAMHSA. Um, and... Uh, had I heard of SAMHSA, uh, because, you know, sort of I was hanging around in circles. And when I lived in D.C., I was hanging around in circles where, you know, I would bump into people like John Shinholzer, for example, and Carol McDade. 
um, uh, Tom Hill is a pal from uh, from my DC days. I never realized that he was a bit of a noise in government. Uh-huh. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, sort of so, so it, it wasn't that I never heard of SAMHSA necessarily. Um, it's just that, that these institutions and organizations uh, did not impinge on me or my practice in any way. And um, uh, so it wasn't until I came to New York City uh, to live in New York City, because I'm a city girl, live in the city, city girls live in the city, mm-hmm. um, uh, that I started looking for opportunities to train coaches in recovery as a specialization or a particular focus um, in the, uh, the coaching profession. And that's where I fell in with uh, the, the CCAR world of uh, RCA, uh, warmed to it immediately halfway through day one, as, as I've said. I remember coming home that evening and saying to my roommate, you know, this William White guy, I'm going to have to meet him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, sort of, and, and, uh, and then, you know, sort of uh, Donna Pagan, uh, in New York City opened up opportunities for me to start actually training, um, you know, sort of using uh, CCAR uh, products and, of course, you know, sprinkling my own emerald dust over them. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, sort of, so that's how I came to you all. And I subsequently came to uh, to understand that, you know, sort of that uh, organizations like Oasis, the, uh, the state agency here in New York State, um, were major players um, whether I was on board with them or not, um, or you know, sort of whether they necessarily spoke to the world that I was coming from or not. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, sort of, so that that that's all. I'm very recent to that particular uh, uh, piece of the field. But as I say, five or six years. It's five years since I met you, uh, folks, uh, for real in mm-hmm. Connecticut. Um, so you know, sort of, I'm a fairly recent arrival, a blow in even. Well, um, on a very welcome arrival, I, I'm curious, though, how did you move from Ireland to the United States, and what happened there? Go west, young woman. Really? Just this tra- this travel urge? Was there an a um, inciting uh, incident or anything? Uh, not not di- no, directly. I visited um, uh, Manhattan first in the 1980s. I was a cultural ambassador. Um, to the uh, international um, uh, uh, film archivist. She just throws um, this stuff out, you know, like, oh, well, that's um, an ambassador, well, it was, okay. It was, um, <laughs> it, was a, it was an annual gathering at MoMA. So, um, you know, that was my introduction to, to Manhattan. You know, mm-hmm. start at the top. Um, <laughs> why not? Why don't you? And, um, you know, and I'll never forget two things. I'll never forget the first time I saw the Manhattan skyline for real. Mm-hmm. And that was it. That was it. You know, sort of, I thought, okay, I've arrived. Tell wow. me more. And I remember, um, I remember coming up that first morning. It must have been a Monday morning. I remember coming up from the subway. It's like the, the, the like the first scene, the opening scene in the 1958 movie, the best, uh, uh, the best of everything. Uh, coming up out of the subway onto the streets of Manhattan, up there must have been somewhere in the fifties because I was going to MoMA, and um, and looking up at the uh, at the buildings and thinking, "Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, this is me. This is where I belong." Um, uh, now it took me <laughs> twenty five years or something to get here as a resident, mm-hmm. but nobody, nobody ever. Came never accused me of being fast off the mark um, that you know that preparation stage um, in the stages of change model I'm all over that I can live in that stage for a very long time <laughs> but when I make my move I make my move but um, uh, so um, so living here was an, an ambition of decades but um, I had very deep roots in Dublin um, and a, a life partnership and uh, you know, sort of, and a and an, and an engagement in public life, um, which uh, you know, sort of, which would have to change radically for me to be able to uh, to to 
move my life lock, stock and barrel. Um, and uh, I grew up with a very strong uh, ethic of um, re returning the favor, shall we say. Um, one of the many benefits that I enjoyed as uh, growing up in Ireland was a uh, free education. I got a first class education from the uh, Dominican nuns and it did not cost my parents one dime more than uh, their, my father's taxes. Mm. And the, um, the ethos in our family really was um, uh, if, if you receive much, you owe much. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had to come to a point in my uh, in my public life where I felt that I had discharged that debt before I felt that I could um, be emancipated enough to do the second half of my life elsewhere or more authentically on my own terms. Mm. Um, so, uh, so there's a sense in which I had to bring the first chapter of my life to an organic close. Uh, that was not without its heartaches. Um, before I felt I could actually make the move, get on with the next chapter, and uh, that happened in the uh, late '90s. And uh, of course, the getting on with the next chapter. Um, it, the first task of the next chapter uh, really was to get settled and safe enough here to sober up hmm. and to be able to um, to be able to reconnect to integrate if you like um, uh, the values um, and the experiences and the richness of my background uh, to integrate that into a new world. We still think of America as the new world um, and to, uh, to seek my future here as so many immigrants have before me and since. And, uh, you know, sort of in a, in a, in a real sense, in Ireland, certainly in the Ireland in which I was born, um, we are devoted to our past. In this country, the past matters little to you, although there's plenty of reckoning going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, this country, it was built by this, com this country, for better and for worse, was built by people who were looking to the future. And we immigrants, wherever we're coming from, we immigrants are also looking to the future. I came here to inhabit my future mm -hmm. um, and to integrate my past into that. And that is absolutely the gift that your wonderful country has given me and continues to give me. So what was the turning point for you that you got into recovery once you came here? What was it that you found that you hadn't had in Ireland? Opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm opportunity um, the um, <clears throat> the ethos here around addiction I found to be refreshing um, the idea that um, uh, that you know sort of that addiction is a is a medical condition to be managed the way we manage other uh, everyday medical conditions. I mean, life is a medical condition, and <laughs> God damn it, it's fatal. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but, um, um, but as we navigate, uh, as we navigate life, we manage all kinds of uh, medical challenges. Mm -hmm. We do that effectively, or effectively enough, to get on with it. Um, you know, sort of everything from the high blood pressure that I inherited from my father through to, you know, um, I've broken my feet and twisted my ankles to, you know, 
um, to the ordinary, uh, you know, sort of challenges of not being 18 years of age anymore and so on and so forth. We manage all of that stuff as part of the, the privilege of being alive. And in this country, I found an ethos that was able to enfold addiction and personal management of addiction into that, um, uh, that framework, that rubric is William White would call it. And um, that opportunity I had not found in Ireland where, um, uh, where to be identified as, as somebody with a substance use disorder, to put your hand up for, I mean, there's no better way of identifying as such a person than to put your hand up and ask for help. Um, you know, sort of, I mean, we can ignore you if you don't put your hand up for help. If you put your hand up for help, then, um, you know, sort of then um, certainly 25, 30 years ago, people are working diligently to change this. Um, you were self-identifying as a contemporary leper and um, that we needed to find Father Damien for you and we needed to find a leper colony to isolate you in. It could be, you know, it could even be the, the rooms of the 12 steps, for, for instance, were treated not unlike a leper colony. And, um, you know, and if you would be so kind as to wear a bell so that we know that you're coming uh, so that we can get out of your way, uh, that would be that would also be helpful. Wow. And, uh, and meanwhile, and meanwhile, um, we'll also cast you in the role of scapegoat. Mm -hmm. So you can carry. Uh, the addiction of the family, you can ad carry the addiction of your community, you can carry the addiction of uh, a country, a country. Uh, why don't you, as if you don't have enough at, uh, on your shoulders. You're a strong person, Ruth, you can carry it. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of, I did not, shall we say, find that environment conducive mm -hmm. to recovery. So I came here. Wow. Ruth, you have some strong opinions, which I've always appreciated no. about you too. No. And I've also heard, you know, this theme of integration has gone throughout our talk. I'm really curious as to what life is like for you today. How would you describe your life today? It's very great. What a really great question. Mm -hmm. In my Irish way, I'll begin with a digression. Mm -hmm. When I came into uh, the uh, into twelve step rooms first, um, you know, sort of, when I heard all the war stories, and I had to be taught that the value of hearing war stories is first that um, you listen out for your own story, and that's how you learn the skill of identification. And then, uh, you know, sort of, and then you listen to war stories to be reminded of where you came from and that uh, every day we have a decision. You know, do I want to go back there? You know, do I want to reclaim my misery? Do I want to go back to the pawn shop, mm -hmm. a.k.a. the bar or the off license or whatever, and reclaim my misery? Um, and, um, you know, sort of I found that all very helpful as far as it went. But what I wanted to know was what does the phrase a second uh, life second to none mean for you today? What, you know, sort of if, if you're living your, beyond your wildest dreams, where are you going to be at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning? What are you going to be wearing? What are you going to be eating and drinking? What are you going to be doing? What are, what are your plans for the day going to be? Who's going to be in your life? I wanted to know that. Mm. I wanted to know the answer to that. And that is essentially the same question that you've just asked me, Phil. What's your life like today? Mm -hmm. And um, as far as I'm concerned, that's the message that recovery coaches carry. Is, the, is, the, uh, is what my life is like today that works for me. Mm -hmm. And you can have your version of this life too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, and we can be doing this together, and we can be doing this in community, and we can be doing this in society, and we don't need to be living on Lepers Island to do it. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, so my life today is no longer a life that I define materially. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm no longer interested in, you know, an inventory of what I have. Mm. Um, that fell away from me at some point um, several years ago, and just as well, too, because I've always belonged to uh, what uh, my banker friend describes as a socioeconomic group, the pits. <laughs> um, and, um, um, but my life is defined today, uh, Phil, much as you and uh, and Art and um, uh, Bill White and all the uh, the other authors of the Recovery Coach Academy. What you define as the that um, uh, that fifth stage of recovery, a life um, in uh, in gratitude mm-hmm. and um, uh, ex- an acceptance and. Um, a life in, in a sense of abundance. That's where I live today. I live in that sense of um, spiritual abundance. Mm. It isn't just that I have everything that I need. Of course I have everything that I need. I'm still breathing. By definition, I have everything that I need to live today. I'm able to breathe. Um, but it get, but wait, it, there's more. And, um, uh, you know, sort of, and I discover that I am surrounded by the paraphernalia, people, places, and things, the paraphernalia of my life, my decisions, the little and the big decisions, the decision that I made about this particular color scheme for my furnishings, the decision that I made about the work that I'm going to be doing today, the decisions that I made about um, uh, the folks I want to hang out with, the decisions that I made about the food that's in my pantry, um, that my life is um, a cornucopia of decisions that I've made about my life. I think that would, that's what you know, sort of Tom Hill and his group mean by living a self-directed life. Mm-hmm. And I'm in touch with the gratitude not only for those staples, you know, uh, you know sort of clean bed sheets are good, a change of clean bed sheets are good. Uh, the neighborhood laundromat is good. Um, but not only for the, the minutia of it, but for the, the big picture abundance of all of it together. The tapestry and the, the, the weft of my life. Um, and being in touch with my gratitude for all of that. Um, that's how I live today. And, um, and for me, that sense of living in gratitude, um, in uh, in acceptance, that uh, that that sense of understanding myself as both precious and um, you know sort of infinitesimal mm-hmm. at the same time. Um, what a gift, um, you know, sort of of uh, of having some humility around what who I am and what I can and cannot do. Um, you know, sort of these are. These are spiritual qualities. I understand that, and um, and spiritual abundance is just about impossible to describe mm. in uh, in the rooms to folks who have uh, who are shaking and baking, as we say in Maine, the great mm-hmm. state of Maine. To folks like me, when I came in, you know, sort of, I wasn't a wet week in the rooms, and I wanted to know what you were up to on Tuesday. Well, I could have told you, or I could have given you, I could have given you an, an answer from where I am now, but I'm not sure that it could have been understood. So I, I keep the answer to my question, to your question, I keep the answer to your question as being, Phil, just for today, I'm, uh, I have a range of signature pearls and I'm wearing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a good day. Yeah. I, I remember when I greet Art Woodard, I'd say, um, Art, good morning. How are you today? And I can hear his words so clearly. He'd always say, I'm well enough. How are you? And he'd always say that. And I say it now. It's, it's just a, a beautiful a beautiful notion that I'm well enough. It, it oozes gratitude to me. And you're talking about that stage of fulfillment that we talk about in the Recovery Coach Academy. And my life is so full today um, 
and I've really been wrestling spiritually with not my purpose. I know my purpose in life is to coach recovery. It's how I'm wired. It's all my life integrated to who I am today is I'm a coach at heart. Recovery is my life. Life is recovery. So mm -hmm. I want to coach that for other people and along the same lines of, like you said, of being an educator. But what is the meaning of life? And I can't, after 62 years of pondering that question off and on, I came to the conclusion that for me, it's to enjoy it. And then I was telling our daughter, Samantha, this, and uh, Sandy and I are on a call with her. She's in Kenya. And she said, well, Dad, I think it's to enjoy God. And I've even expanded that. It's to enjoy God's creation. So for me, it's about adventure. It's about other people. It's about finding a moment of awe and wonder every day. And if I enjoy life, I want my kids to enjoy life. Why wouldn't my higher power, my God, want me to enjoy life? I think we're wired similarly. And I do see that you are, you are very deep in your thoughts, in your intellectual process. But I also know how much you thoroughly enjoy your life in educating others. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, and that's something that, that I look for in folks who are uh, taking the Recovery Coach Academy is curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of, uh, because th that's certainly the motor, I think, that, that we share, that propels us. You know, really, I genuinely am. I'm curious about you. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, so I'm curious about what makes you tick, and I'm curious about uh, this, and I'm curious about that. Um, uh, you know, sort of. There's a there's a lovely moment at the end of one of my favorite films um, uh, that it was the first time Russell Crowe came to uh, to my attention. That, that that film about the whistleblower, the tobacco whistleblower, Al Pacino stars in it, and um, uh, as Lowell Bergman, the uh, the producer. And at the end of the, at the end of the movie, uh, Christopher Plummer, who's playing uh, Mike Wallace, comes comes to his producer with the next story, another story. And uh, they've just had this huge whistleblower around tobacco story, and now they're moving on to the next uh, the, the next thing. And 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 the Wallace character says to him, uh, you know, sort of, are, uh, are you interested? You know, pitch me a story. Are you interested? And uh, Al Pacino turns to him and says, "We're interested in everything." Mm. Mm. And um, I remember actually I saw this in uh, in a in a, a theater in the middle of nowhere, um, uh, outer Boston. And I remember jumping up in the theater in my seat and saying, "Yes!" <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, and that was um, that was uh, nineteen ninety nine. I think that movie so in ninety eight or in ninety nine. One last question as we wrap up. What are you looking forward to? The next thing. Mm -hmm. And you have no, yep. Yeah. And you have an, another adventure planned. Um, put it this way. I have another adventure scheduled. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. And is um, it, I, I do hope and look forward to seeing the pair of you in Florida. Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm keeping a skeptical eye over the COVID figures. Mm -hmm. um, the, the deaths um, uh, graph has been trending down uh, consistently. That's good. Mm -hmm. But the new cases uh, graph has been trending up. Mm -hmm. That's not good. Mm -mm. So, um, you know, sort of, so we keep our expectations in check. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sort of, uh, but I really am very much looking forward to the Florida experience. Yeah, we are too. So one one last thing, Ruth, while you have me on the line yes, and you have it. this curiosity, is there anything that you would like to know about Phil that you haven't already experienced? Oh. <laughs> what the hell? The only, the, what hey, the hell? <laughs> The only thing I want to know about Phil is, you know, sort of, what are your Irish connections, Phil? Let's get real here. I don't know that I, he has many. I, I have 4%. Yeah. 
No, I, I no, I'm English, Scotch, and Irish, but predominantly English. So I guess we're mortal enemies on some level, right? Uh, oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Seven hundred years or nine hundred years to enemies, depending on who you're asking. Right. Um, but it'll be shamrocks for both of you on uh, March 17. I promise you that. All right. Uh, thank you, Ruth, so thank much. You so I. Much. Um, I'll be thinking about what you said for days, and I really appreciate that about you. So thank you for sharing your experience, strength, hope, and wisdom. You're a gem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And right back at you, uh, the, uh, uh, thank you for the gift of your work. 